found for Organ Group. We are on our final chapter today as we end our journey with Mary Ellen and her family as they are now in Oregon. So let's see how the story ends. Chapter 16. Father rented 40 acres of land. He mortgaged one pair of our oxen for grain, seed grain, and sold bright for $30 to buy some of the supplies we needed. On the land was a one room log cabin with a stone fireplace for cooking and a storeroom on, at the north end. We set up our tent nearby and went to work fixing it up. The first thing Father did was to make rockers for the padded box that first Cynthia and then Elijah had slept in during the journey. Now you have a real cradle, I told him, as Mother placed Elijah in it for the first time. He lit, lay there looking up at us, kicking and cooing and smiling. He was such a happy baby. It seemed to me that his bright, dark eyes were staring straight into mine. He knows me, I thought, and I wondered if, young as he was, Elijah remembered that I was the one who had carried him over those last rough, steep parts of the trail. I reached out my hand and gently rocked the cradle until his eyes fluttered closed. Next, Father built a table, some rough stools to sit on, and bedsteads for all of us. The bedsteads were made from young trees, trimmed down into poles and fastened to the walls. On the shelves underneath the frames, he piled fragrant fir branches. On top of those went the feather ticks we had carried all the way across the plains. And on top of the ticks are goose down pillows and bright colored quilts. It felt good to finally sleep on a real bed again. In the meantime, Mother and I were busy papering good boxes to use as cupboards and dressers. One morning, I took every one of our cooking utensils and the big brass kettle down to a nearby spring. There, with ashes, sand, and soap, I did my best to scour, scour away all the signs of our long journey. The next day, we unpacked everything from the wagon and set it in place. On crude shelves built into the wall went the two remaining blue and white cups from her mother's china that mother had refused to part with on the trail, the small cracked looking glass that father had used for shaving, our few books, father's Bible, and a tiny, or, or sorry, a faded tin type picture of grandma with all her living children. There, said mother, looking pleased with her efforts, now we are at home. Seeing the picture reminded me that our folks back in Arkansas did not know that we had arrived safely in Oregon. May I write a letter to grandma, I asked. Of course, said mother. She wrote a letter home and let me put mine with it. Dear grandma, it is with pleasure that I take up my pen to write you a few lines. We are all well at present. I have seen many curiosities since I last saw you. Parts of the journey I liked very much, but some were tiresome. There was a great deal of sickness and parts of the road were almost impossible to travel. I am sorry to tell you that Daisy was drowned on the Caw River and Lily died from eating a poison weed. We arrived on the 16th of October, making our journey six months long. I like Oregon very well what I've seen of it, but it does not seem like home. I cannot be running over to grandma's house like I used to do. We have neighbors, but no meeting house and no schoolhouse. Father will teach us this winter. There is talk of building a schoolhouse in the spring. You should see Elijah. He is a good baby and hardly cries except for when he's hungry. Luvina and I have the thimbles you gave us and we are sewing on our quilts. I now have 14 squares. We have your likeness, and it does us all a great deal of good to look at it. I have written everything I can think of, so I had better close. Give my love to Uncle Jimmy and Cousin Will and Great Aunt Harriet and all the rest, and write soon. Yours affectionately, Mary Ellen Todd. As soon as I finished writing, I realized I had said nothing about Grandma coming with us to Oregon, and I knew the reason that I hadn't. The feeling had been coming over me for a long time. The chances were that grandma would not be able to make that long, hard journey. 
Once she could have. I could imagine her as a young woman striding over those plains and rivers and mountains as easily as if she were stepping on the clouds. But she was old now and not so strong. Probably, I thought, we would never see Grandma again. I felt a pang of loneliness then, so sharp that it was like a deep down ache in my insides, an ache that might never go away. My eyes were stinging with tears as I folded the letter to give to, Grant, to Mother. As soon as the cabin was roughly furnished, Father and John put in a crop. To tide us over till harvesting time, Father got some extra work splitting, splitting rails for fences and John went to work on a neighboring farm, coming home only on Sundays. But even this might not have been enough to get us through the winter, Father said. So Mother bought a spinning wheel. She and Luvina and I spun wool into yarn and knitted it into socks, which Mother found she could sell at a good price. Every evening, sitting around the stone fireplace, Luvina and I had to knit, knit one inch. Father was not used to splitting rails, and one day he injured both of his hands. Bruises turned into abscesses, and for several weeks he could not do any work. While we were sorry to see him suffer, I enjoyed having the chance to wait on him. Luvina and I fed him, tied his shoes, combed his hair, and turned the pages of his book. I don't know what I would do without you children, he said, smiling. Why do you have to split rails, I asked him. Couldn't you make pottery instead like you used to? Father shook his head regretfully. I have no kiln. He reminded me, and even if I did, very few people settling hereabouts could afford to buy my wares. No, we have come to a place where the land is rich. We must put our strength into the farming now. Father had been able to buy half a side of beef and a few vegetables, so we would not go hungry that winter. Still, I kept longing for more vegetables. John was always teasing me about my mountain fever appetite. One day, while Poking through some dense high weeds, I discovered a little pat patch of forgotten potatoes on a neighbor's land. Can I dig them up? I asked father. You will have to ask Mr. Corkle, he replied. Perhaps he will let you do it on our shares. So I mustered up the courage and went to talk to him. Mr. McCorkle looked at me, shrewd blue eyes peering out of his round, white whiskered face. On shares, you say, he repeated frowning doubtfully, half for your family and half for me? I nodded. Suddenly, he thrust out his hand. All right, young lady, he agreed. You have a deal. Luvina and I went to work. It was difficult hunting for the dried up vines among all the tall weeds and then digging the small potatoes out of the ground. Winter was fast approaching and the cold made our fingers sting. Sometimes Luvina cried. Her hands ached so much. We took to making fires, working a while, then stopping to warm ourselves around the small blaze. We kept at it day after day until at last we had six sacks of potatoes for ourselves and six for Mr. McCorkle. When I brought them to show mother, her face broke into one of her rare smiles. I am proud of you, Mary Ellen, she told me. You stuck to the task until it was done. It must have been that mountain appetite that made you dig so hard, Father added, laughing. You shall, you two shall have new books for this. And come spring, new dresses, promised Mother. I felt warm inside, almost as if I was standing close by the fire. Mother did care for me. I could feel it, even if she was never going to show it with hugs and kisses the way Grandma did. Then suddenly I realized something else. It had been weeks now since I thought about my real mother. That picture of her that I carried around so long in my head seemed to have slipped away. And somehow, without even noticing it, mother had taken her place. Time passed and now it was truly winter. We rejoiced that we had our snug little cabin, enough food to eat, good warm fires and books to read. Polly and Blackie and the remaining cattle rested and fed in rich pastures and Rover was his old self again, happily chasing squirrels. Sometimes on warm days, Luvina and I still played in our covered wagon, which now stood empty near the cabin. One day, sitting up on the spring seat, I picked up Father's whip again. Once more, I tried to crack it in the way he did, and once more, I still couldn't do it. Still, it seemed to me it didn't feel quite as heavy. 
Every day after that, while Luvina played her pretend games with our dolls inside the wagon, I practiced lifting the big whip, holding it over the heads of an imaginary team of oxen, flicking my wrist hard. And finally, one day I heard a faint pop. You did it, exclaimed Luvina, poking her brown head out of the wagon. You made it crack. Yes, I said happily. A few days now, or a few days later, as I was approaching the cabin door carrying the water bucket, I overheard father and mother talking. Did you know, said father, that Mary Ellen is beginning to be able to crack the whip? Pride welled up inside of me and brimmed over in a smile. But then I heard mother's reply. I'm afraid that is not a very ladylike thing to do, she said. There it was again, that constant concern about me being a lady. Mother would always be pushing it at me, it seemed, and I would always be resisting. But in spite of her words, I walked around for the next few days filled with a secret joy. I had the power to set things going. It was December now, and the days were drawing near to Christmas. To get ready for our first celebration in our new home, Mother cleaned the cabin from top to bottom. Luvina and I went out into the woods and gathered ferns and vines and evergreen branches. Arranging them in bunches, we direct decorated the walls and shelves and table. Then we helped mother make six real candles. She had bow borrowed the candle molds from Mr. or Mrs. Doherty, another one of our neighbors. In the center of each mold, we carefully placed a cotton wick. After that, we poured in hot tallow and let it cool. When the tallow was set, we warmed the molds just a little, and out came six nice straight white candles. On Christmas morning, I was the first to wake up. For a moment, I lay there beneath my two warm quilts, breathing in the sweet piney scent of evergreens. Then opening my eyes, I looked around at the looping chains of evergreens hanging from the shelves, the pickle jar filled with ferns on the table, and next to it, the beautiful brass candlestick with all its tall white candle waiting to be lighted. I nudged Luvina sleeping next to me. Christmas gift, I whispered in her ear. It was a game we played in our family every Christmas morning. The one who said this greeting first scored a point. In, a more, in the moment, Luvina was jumping out of bed and whispering in Cynthia's ear, Christmas gift. And soon everyone was up greeting each other and laughing. Christmas gift, Christmas gift. We did not expect any real gifts this year, but mother surprised Luvina and me with mittens that she had knitted for us late in the evenings after we were asleep. And father had carved a doll with a wooden head and mother had dressed it in scraps of red and white fabric for Cynthia. So now she had a doll just like ours. And for baby Elijah, there was a string of buttons to play with. I yike her. Cynthia kept squealing with excitement, her pudgy feelings, pud pudgy fingers holding her new doll tight. At noon, we sat down to Christmas dinner. The table was covered with tasty dishes, roast beef and gravy, mashed potatoes, cabbage slaw, cornbread baked in our Dutch oven, and sweet butter to go with it. Mother also made some pumpkin butter, which added a spicy flavor. With all this and mother's sweet cake, and some stick candy that John had brought us. We were as full as we could be. After dinner, we sang hymns and carols for a while. Then father brought out his chessboard and he and John settled in for a game, while mother and I tried to teach Luvina to, to play che checkers. Later, the three of us children went outside and played hide and seek, and Annie over the pussy wa wants a corner. We played until Cynthia stubbed her toe and started to cry, and then we all went back inside. Finally, the evening chores were done. The cows had been milked and the animals fed. It was time to light our Christmas candles. One by one, Father put a match to them and the cabin was filled with warm, flickering glow. Oh, breathed Cynthia, her eyes wide. We gathered around the stone fireplace, Father and mother in the two splint bottomed easy chairs, the rest of us on the floor. Father cracked hazelnuts while mother set some corn to popping in the Dutch oven. Looking into the flames, seeing the old familiar chairs drawn up by the fire, smelling with a warm smell of popcorn, I thought that our cabin was beginning to feel like home. Remember that time we used to 
Or we tried to pop corn out in the rain near the Kaw River, John asked, grinning. It was all hard and tasted like smoke, I recalled, but we thought it was good. Then I remembered something else. And how about the two-year-old yearling that was drowned in the crossing? John's face flushed pink, but then he retorted by singing, enter into my jaw and sit down on my throat, and I had to laugh. After a few minutes, mother settled down in her easy chair. Her, her face seemed to have filled out and become softer in the last few weeks. I wonder what it is like now out in the plains, she said. In many places, the snow could be several feet deep and the temperature well below zero, father answered. I wouldn't want to be stranded out there middle of winter. I thought about the constant wind out on the plains, how fierce and icy it would be now. I thought about the blowing snow and the howling wolves, and in spite of the cheerful warmth of the fire, I felt myself shiver. I hope all the wagon trains got all, through all right, I said. Mother seemed far away, thinking of something. I keep wondering about the Grants, she said softly. We talked about the Grants and brave Mrs. McReynolds and her brood of children and the Ted Roses and Sarah Jane's family. I thought of the mule train with the words sure and swift painted on its wet wagon cover that had been passing us and the frightful family that had turned back because of cholera on the Platte River. What were they all doing now? They reminded me again of grandma and our other relatives back in Arkansas. Do you think they have our letters now and know we are safe, I asked. I hope so, answered mother, and soon we will have a letter from them. I would keep on writing to grandma. I would tell her all about our first Christmas and how Elijah could roll over now and might be getting his first tooth. I would tell her about the books that father had borrowed from Mr. McCorkle and the latest plans for building a schoolhouse. Even if she could not come to live with us in Oregon, we could stay close to each other by letter. Then all at once, I had a wonderful idea. I would take my nine patch squares that grandma had started me on and I would sew them into a quilt for Elijah. I had enough almost for a baby quilt. It would be a special gift to him from me, but it would also be a gift from grandma, another way of remembering her. I couldn't help smiling at the thought. Then father took down his Bible from the shelf and we drew close together while he read the story of the first Christmas. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. I looked at our baby Elijah, sleeping peacefully now in his cradle next to the fireplace. Cynthia had fallen asleep too in mother's arms, still clutching her new doll close to her. Luvina was beginning to yawn. It was time for bed. Sleepily, Luvina and I crawled under the quilts. Mother tucked them snugly around us. Good night, came her quiet voice. I felt something touch my hair as light and as soft as a whisper, or maybe an angel's wing. Was it mother's hand? It was gone so quickly that I could not be sure. Then father blew out the candle and everything was still. <laughs>